kids. I love the kids. I love them so much, I'm going to let them go. Lord bless the children. <laughs> Get them out of the building. Lord bless our teachers. They are quiet. They're so quiet in here today, I didn't even know it. Amen. And growing up. Man, when, you, when you've dedicated children and baptized children, then you marry those kids, and them kids have kids, and you dedicate those kids, you think, dear God, I've been here a long time. That's kind of how I feel. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And I'll repeat this verse again before it's over, but I needed to say it to you because this word belief, God instilled inside of you a belief system, and you have to activate it. You have to believe. I'm just going to tell you, you have to believe. You have to believe that God is for you and not against you. You have to believe that there's a heaven waiting on you and your loved ones. You have to believe that you're going to see people that have exited this planet again. You have to believe. If you don't, because you're going to believe something. You're going to believe something. You're going to believe that you should always be downtrodden, beat up, uh, never gain anything in life. You, you can start believing that if you want to. But some way in your mind, you're going to believe something. And Hebrews tells us, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, I've found as I've gotten older as a father that there are times my kids want to please me. And that, that's a neat thing when it happens. Because as a parent, a lot of times we just spend all our time pleasing our kids and grandkids. But to be pleased, to please God. Because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists. He exists. He's here. Amen. He's around us. He's, he's omniscient, omni, uh, omnipotent, all-powerful. He's everywhere. Must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Pastor Mike told me this morning, he said, prayer is a labor. you got to labor to pray, to stay on it, to, to seek after him, to, to pursue him, to, to love him more. David said, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for him. I'm after him. So to earnestly seek after him. So when I'm reading this verse, I'm thinking about the Hebrew writers who brings out Moses and Abraham and Samson and, and Jephthah and Barak and, he, and, and Deborah. He just brings out all kind of writers. But he says to us that you must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now I'm going to flip back to the Old Testament and talk to you a little bit about King David, the boy David, the giant slayer, the sweet psalmist of Israel, David. We've all we fallen in love with David. I mean, he's just a, that guy. And David said this in Psalm 16. He said, keep me safe, O God. Now, I say this all the time to people. When I get on my Harley, people say, be safe, and I laugh at them. Because if I wanted to be safe, I wouldn't be on my Harley. If I want to be safe, I won't jump out of a plane. If I want to be safe, I wouldn't stand on a 40-foot tower all summer long throwing kids off of it. If I want to be safe, I would make sure that I was careful getting into the shower and getting out. There's no safety in our species. Amen, there's really not. But my safety is in God. So as long as I stay in God, I stay safe. But just being in this world, my goodness, Sudan is erupting right now with power struggles. Ukraine and Russia, you, all over the world there's fighting. And there's, there's no safety out there. You grab your gun and run out and somebody says, be safe. There's no say. So I read the Word of God, and I see this man who was a warrior's warrior, a man who went to fight against Goliath as a young man, a man who understood that even being in a political place known as the king is not a safe place. It's not, because his own son Absalom went to try to kill him. So David, he understands that. So he says, let me just be clear here. My safety is in God. I'm just going to stay in Him. For in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. You chase little G's, money, sex, power. You chase little G's, there's no hope in that. There's, there, there is no, there's only sorrow there. He said, I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Speaking of the other little G's. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Now I'm going to talk some about the lines. I'm going to talk about the boundaries. We'll talk about inheritance. 
but, but I'm going to help you understand a little bit more. When you read this, you say, what, what is he talking about lines? What's he talking about a lot? Now, when we say the word lot, you understand that's a place where you live. It's a lot. Amen. Some of you got a small lot and some of you got too much lot. Come on. Thank you, H. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Who counsels me? He does. I often say, if you'll listen to me here, you don't need me back there. He counsels me. Amen. God is counseling me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Amen. My heart's happy, so my tongue letting everybody know it. Sometimes folks' heart ain't good and their tongue going to let you know it. But when your heart's right, your tongue going to share it. You can't help itself. Your tongue is dipstick to your heart. You'll think of that a minute. I'll not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body is also, it, my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. In other words, this body may go down, but I'm going to go be with him. Amen. So then he walks on to say, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with the joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Talks about the right hand again. So again, this is the whole psalm of chapter 16. Amen. So he's got the whole psalm. Now I'm going to read to you out of the message and just listen to the, how wonderful this is. It, this ain't on the overhead, sis. So. But he said, keep me safe, O God. I've run for your dear life to you. I say to God, be my Lord. Without you, nothing makes sense. Without you, nothing makes sense. And these God-chosen lives all around, what splendid friends they make. Don't just go shopping for a God. Gods are not for sale. I swear, I'll never treat God names like brand names. My choice is you, God, first and only. And now I find I'm your choice. That's so cool. You know, you're my choice, and I find out that I'm your choice. This is a belief system that David lived with. Amen. He believed it. He said, my choice is yours. You set me up with a house and a yard, and then you made me your heir. The wise counsel God gives when I'm awake is confirmed by my sleeping heart. Day and night, I'm going to stick with you, God. I've got a good thing going. I'm not letting it go. I'm happy from the inside out and from the outside in. I'm firmly formed. You canceled my ticket to hell. He canceled my, I had a ticket to hell, and he canceled it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm loving this chapter. I, I, either way you read it. That's not my destination. Now you've got my feet on life's path, all radiant from the shining of your face. Ever since you took my hand, I'm on the right way. See, I have found there are things in life that we're not sure about. There are a lot of things I'm not sure about. We're not sure where we'll be five years from now. Twenty years ago, you'd have never told me I'd been in New Canaan. Twelve years ago, you'd never told me I'd been back in Crosby. Amen. I wasn't sure about a lot of things in life, but there are some things that I'm very sure about. You know, it is time for us to realize that he is more than just the one who rescued us from hell. He is also the magistrate of maintaining our life and sustaining our soul. I'm going to tell you, one word that I've always struggled with is maintenance. I do not like maintenance. I hate it. And because of that, God has given me a life of 40-something years of maintenance. Yeah, I, I, would, I mean, I've set chairs up in schools. We set chairs up in, 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 in we, we've had church in a, uh, funeral homes. Everything we've done has been maintenance. Then it's like when I finally get things established, God moves me. I have to just say that he moves me. And they end up on a property of 110 acres with buildings that are desperately in need of maintenance. Yeah. Everything there is maintenance. Then we get this building. This building was needed to maintenance. Everything got to do with maintenance. You get a vehicle. You get a new car. And you think, this is good. You keep it a few years. Next thing you know, what are you doing? If you don't maintain it, amen, it's going to break down. So we serve a God who is our maintainer. Amen. He's always looking out. And he's also our sustainer. Can I get an amen? He maintains and sustains. He gets us started. And he's always working on me you have never got to a place where you're perfect or mature it's not happened yet i've been doing this 40 something years and i say god my life has been three steps forward and four steps back sometimes sometimes i thought it's two steps back actually it was four i regressed amen but god's always maintained so this belief system that i have is that god has my world in his hands we used to sing a song when we were little. He's got the whole world in his hands. But it's true, and it's biblical when you understand it. Amen. Isaiah 41 says, so do not fear. I'm with you. 
Again, it's a belief system. Do not be dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I'm going to help you. I'll uphold you again with my righteous right hand. There's that right hand again. Always hold us up with his right hand. It says on the left hand where he doth work. That's in the book of Job. The only place where it mentions his left hand. God's not schizophrenic, but he is ambidextrous. Can I get an amen? amen? When considering this psalm, look at what David's confidence, his belief in God. In these verses that I read out of verse 5 and verse 6, Lord, you have assigned me my portion. And my cup, you've made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I have a home. I have a yard. You've done that. The word lot here is my destiny. You've got my destiny in your hands. My lines, the measurement. You know, when we measure things, you can't build without a measuring tape. And all through history, they've had lines that they've used to measure things, the height, the depth, the breadth. He said, listen, my lines, and when you read that word, also in the Hebrew language, it speaks of an idea of that, God, you have helped me deal with the stress in my life. You're big enough to help me deal with all this. In other words, you determine the stress load or the distance I'm going to go. I'm telling you that God is big enough to handle everything you've got going on in your life. But it comes with you believing that, to believe and to hold on to that. It, it's fallen, it's accepted in, in pleasant places. There are times I look at God and I say, you have been so good to me. I mean, and here's, here's, the, here's not the problem, but the blessing. I believe it. I believe I'm highly favored. I believe my children and grandkids are going to be highly favored. I believe that God favors everybody in this house. And when you start believing that, it changes the way you think. Amen. He's got the whole world. Everybody say the whole world. The whole world, the whole world in his hands. Yeah, you know, I find pleasure in my lines, in my home, in my place. Now listen, God understands our stress level. So, Pastor Joseph, when we lost our homes in the hurricane. Pastor Joseph, David, when we lost our homes in the floods, amen. Joseph showed me a picture, a video a while back of me talking during the flood. It was just a minor flood. It only got so much. Uh, Josiah has lost two vehicles in the floods. You know what God said? I know your stress level. I know you can handle it. I know you didn't need all that stuff anyway. I got better stuff coming. Are you hearing me? Amen. And life started working out for the better. And I, I mean, there were times I thought, we're not going, because we're trying to pass to the church and do the weddings and funerals, do all this stuff, and still having to rebuild everything. Meeting six days a week, eating tacos in the morning, amen, and going and working on buildings. We, saw, we scattered all over the place. We didn't know five people going to show up or 50 people going to show up. But we did it, and we just kept on doing it. And that's just one thing. In starting churches or through life, there's always that level of stress. And God says, listen, to David, he said, I know you're a political leader. I know you're a king. I know you've done this, but I got your stress level. I'm going to be able to help you. Because I hear people say that a lot. I'm just stressed. I'm stressed. People say, Pastor, you just when you, I know you're too busy. And I go, well, I ain't been busy in 20 years. I refuse to be busy. I'm extremely effective, but I ain't busy. I chose not to be because I know stress will get on. There's, a, there's things that you don't have to take on you. You don't have to take everybody's problem around you. Amen. You don't have to go hunting for stuff. It'll find you. He, David went on to say in verse 6, I have a goodly heritage. The word goodly, Cheryl, means to glisten. Amen. It means I shine for. There's a shine to you. Amen. It's to cause you to possess. Or something to glisten means it's easily seen. In other words, my possessions cannot hide from me. God keeps bringing them in. God will make obvious what is mine, what belongs to me. There are certain things that belong to us as believers. Love belongs to us. Joy belongs to us. Peace belongs to us. Let me break something down to you real, very quick. Speaking of salt, being a little bit salt. We as a people of believers, are strong, we struggle with this uh, uh, trans thing that's going on. I know you do. And yet it affects every one of us. Now here's the problem. If you're part of the LGBTQ people, then they only think two ways. Either you hate us or you affirm us. You have to affirm us. You either hate us or affirm us. Let me tell you something as a believer in Christ. You're called to love. So you are to love lesbians and gays, 
Trans. I, I know that. I know that some of you say, oh, "Okay, yes, you do. You're called to love them, but you're not called to affirm them." I can't affirm you. I can't hit like on your Facebook page. I can't comment, "You goat girl." Come on. Come on. I can't do that. And I don't do that. I can't defer. But if you want to talk to me, I'm going to tell you something. I love you. I love you. I'll hug you. I'll blow in your ear. But I, as far as I'm going, I'm going to love you because I'm called to love. You see the difference here? So here's when, I, when I'm talking about being salt and light, this learning location, learning how to deal with life. And David, David goes on to say, let me tell you something about God. He sustains my life and maintains my life. The book of Hebrews chapter 1 says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir, heir of all things. Talking about Jesus. And through him he made the universe. Hold on. What did you just say? In God, he made the whole universe, earth, moon, sun, Pluto, all of it. Amen. The galaxy, everything you see. He made all of that through his son. Crazy. Whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So when God spoke, things happen. It's, it continually happens. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. A sustaining, upholding. The Greek word means to bear, to carry. His word carries weight. When he spoke his word, things happen. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11 says, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Did you know that God knows how much Pikes Peak weighs? How much Everest weighs? When I'm reading this, who can fathom the Spirit of the Lord? Or instruct him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult? To enlighten him, to create you and this earth? Who did he consult? Who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? See, when I'm reading this, I realize three things about God very quick. Listen, first one, he loves you too much to hurt you. He gathers you like a lamb in his arm. He, if you got hurt, it wasn't him that did it. Amen. He loves you too much. He's too powerful to, powerful to fail. His hand's too strong. Amen. He's too wise to make a mistake. As I'm walking through, who directed the Spirit of the Lord? Who is smarter than God? Where did God go to school? He didn't. The prophet's saying, take a look. He's all wisdom, past, present, future, and has an incredible plan for you. The earth, sustaining the earth. The earth, listen, the earth this is mind-blowing. The earth is 8,000 miles in diameter. That's how thick it is, okay? 8,000 miles. The sun is 86,000 miles diameter. The earth is 25,000 miles around. That's a big place. Go to the next one. The speed we're traveling on this earth is 1,000 miles an hour. Now, I averaged it up. I, I go up. It's 900-something miles. So we're traveling... Right now, a thousand miles an hour, nine million miles a year. That's why you feel old. <laughs> it's crazy. You can look all this up too. I know you will. The earth is also going around the sun at 18 miles per second. That's a total of 600 million miles per year. Our galaxy is spinning like a cartwheel, six billion miles per year. And we can't feel a thing. We can't feel a thing. You're traveling 1,000 miles an hour, and you can't feel a thing. Why? Why is that, Pastor? Because he upholds by him all things consist. He stuck you here, and you're stuck in this place. The earth is spinning. The sun is spinning. The earth is spinning around the sun. Amen. Everything else is moon spinning around the earth. 
the galaxy's cartwheeling, and we think somehow we have the power to destroy this earth? I just saw over in California a lake that was dry for 40 years. 40 years it was dry in California. They built homes there. They built subdivisions there. They put asphalt roads through there. Called it Main Street. Amen. And guess what the earth did? It just filled back up with water. And all the people are all so mad and upset. Listen, the earth, there's always going to be climate change. The climate's always changing. You just ain't been here long enough to affect it. Amen. God put coal in the ground to burn. God put oil in the ground to make gas. Hello. It was God that did that. And, we, and, and I don't care. Well, you can pull from the sun, the wind. I, it doesn't matter. But I'm just telling you, don't use this scare tactic to try to scare people that the earth, we're destroying the earth. We're not. This thing's spinning, and we winning. Amen. There's a nail-scarred hand holding this thing together. Hallelujah. So how does he hold it together, Pastor? Col Colossians 1, 17, uh, 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 1, verse 17. He is before all things, and in all things hold together. See, this is why I'm telling you, you got to believe. you got to believe in faith. you got to have faith in God. you got to believe that God exists, that he rewards those who diligently seek him. When you believe like that, you got to. he's the one holding everything together. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The words of Jesus, the word of God, created everything. And when you get this belief system inside of you, it will rock everybody's world around you because you're not shaking like they are. You don't get disturbed when things happen around because you believe in a mighty God. His hand, he, he says, I hold the waters. 70% of the earth is water. 70%. And he held it in the palm of his right hand. He held that water, and he said, well, let's see here. Let's see, we're going to call this ocean, so there's a little salt on you. <laughs> and then, then he took it, and he said, that would be the Pacific. That would be the Atlantic. Oh, let's throw a little Sea of Galilee out there to where Jesus could walk on it later on. Then he, he flipped up a little bit, and he took a stream, and he said, that would be the Mississippi. Amen, this would be the Tennessee. That would be the Ohio. And he began to divide waters. All in his hand. And then when he decided to put the stars, the Bible teaches that he took the stars in his hand and he scattered them. Oh, what a day in creation. That God would take the stars and sling them into the heavens and they stuck everywhere he put them. I saw where a comet came, came close to the earth and everybody had their, this was last night, I was watching TV on um, the news and they had their little magnifying glasses out and they'd watch it. He, they said it was 150,000 miles away from us. And they were scared. <laughs> that kind of come flying through. It was 150,000 miles. I don't know how they know it was 150,000 miles. It don't matter. God protects this earth. He scatters the stars. Then he, then he said, I think, I, I, think, I think we need some sand. And then he made the Sahara. <laughs> Pastor, you're crazy. I am. I believe this book. I believe it. So I wish I, I wish I had a national audience. I wish I could preach to the whole world and tell you over and over again. It's by faith. I believe this. Amen. When I when I did that funeral yesterday, I believe it. I believe I believe I'll see that woman again. Amen. And what are you doing? You put hope in the lives of people. To put their hope in God. <laughs> it's the only place I have to put my hope. Amen. So, so upholding, Hebrews 1, 3, upholding all things by the word. Words have power. Your words have power. His words have power. The word there that he, by his word is the word rhema. It is two words. This here is logos. This is logos. This is logos. Logos. Logistics. Here it is. Logos. Amen. So this is a written word. that you. But when it comes alive in you. It's rhema. When you get healed, it was a rhema word that healed you. It's when the word came alive. When you started really believing. See, I don't chase devils. Let me just help you flip that. Devils don't chase me. Because I believe that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I believe that. I believe that Christ in me is the hope of glory. 
Amen. I take this word and I put it inside of me. I, I believe for my parents' salvation, for my brother and my, and my sister. I believe Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. I took that as a word for Jerry. Amen. And I held it to, and for 40 years I believed that. I believe that to, and it was 20 years ago that I baptized my dad and my mama and my sister and my brother. I went back to Alabama and God touched their lives. And I thought, this is a manifestation of a belief system that held on to the Word. Get a rhema inside of you. If you need healing, start reading Psalm 103, Psalm 107, Psalm 91. Start getting a Word inside of you. Say it to yourself. I don't care if people think you're crazy. Walk inside of your laundry room, throw a pair of shoes in that dryer, kick it on, let it make some noise, and start quoting some Scripture. Get in your car on your Harley, on your horse, and start quoting some Scripture. Because this is the only thing that's going to endure forever. The Word of God. Amen. So hold on to this. Oh, i got to keep going. Luke 7, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant. Okay, so he's a, 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 a centurion would be a, a soldier. Amen. A top soldier okay a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die the centurion heard of jesus and sent some elders to the jews of the jews to him asking him to come and heal his servants this man's got clout amen so he's sending some folk to talk to jesus to come and heal his servant when they came to jesus they pleaded earnestly with him this man deserves to have you do this you know he's a good man he's a righteous man and, you know, I'm just going to tell you straight up, Jesus, I don't know you, but I'm going to tell you that he really loves his servant. He's been good to him, and we, we love our master. This was the terms they would use. Amen. It's an employee-employer kind, of, kind of thing. And we would like for you to heal him because he deserves it. Because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Oh, wouldn't it be great to see people love our nation again? To love the house of God again? That's what it's saying here. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Wow. This, this guy really is good. Amen. He has a humility about him. He has an understanding of authority about him. So he said, you don't, you don't have... See, sometimes people think you've always got to visit or to be with them. Jesus would send his word. Because the word, everybody say the word. The Word is what was powerful. When you tell somebody you're praying for them, send the Word. Amen. Pray the Word for them. Amen. Then he says, verse 7, uh, uh, For I do not deserve for you to come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you myself. But say the Word. Say it again. Say the Word. Come on, say it again. Say the Word. One more time. Say the Word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one. I give this one a word to go, and it goes. I give this one a word to come, and it comes. I say to my servant, do this, and I give him the word, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he stopped and said, I'm going to tell you all something. I have not found such great faith. Faith. What is it that pleases God? You must believe that He exists and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Well, God never does nothing for me. Because you whine and you worry and you don't talk to Him. You don't treat Him like Daddy. He's my Daddy. Amen. Yes, He disciplines me. Yes, He whoops me. Yes, He keeps me up at night talking to me. But He's my Daddy. And he loves me. And he said that I got lots and I got lines. He, he's blessed my life. He's given me safety. Amen. In the place where I live, I love him. So he goes on to say he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I've not found such great faith in all of Israel. All of Israel. The whole nation. One man has faith. And he believes. Now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, then the men who had, sent, had been sent returned to the house. And they found the servant, well, Jesus never made it to the house. Never made it to the hospital. Never made it to the morgue. He never made it. Instead, he sent his, man, powerful. If we'd start understanding the word, 
how to use the word, when to say the word, believe in God for the word. Amen. The prodigal's coming home. Wow. I had a, I was just, I'm trying to think who I was with. I was with somebody the other day, and they, they came to, oh, your daddy, Joseph. He said, me and my son, your brother, have reconnected. And he smiled at me and said, God brought the prodigal home. And I look at your daddy and I'm thinking, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father which is in heaven. I didn't say that, but I thought of it. Because he caught something from hearing us talk about God bringing the prodigals home. I'm still believing for more prodigals to come home. You've got to believe for your children. Nobody else, you're the only one that loves that kid. You're the only one that loves that kid. Nobody else likes them. I said, nobody else likes that kid of yours. Yeah, it's probably your fault. But you're the only one that loves them. So you've got to believe God for them. Amen. I mean, some of my kids at times, not you, Katie, but some of my kids at times <laughs> have been pains in the butt to everybody in this church. They've, been, they've gone backwards to everything you've thought. But I love them. And I'll always love them. And whether you like them or not, I'm going to love that kid. And I'm going to believe God for that kid. Yeah, they screwed up. Yeah, they messed up. I may not affirm everything they do, but I sure love them. Amen. I'm going to hug them at night. I'm, I'm going to put Scripture under their pillow. Amen. I'm going to anoint, anoint them with oil when they don't see it coming. Come on, Jesus. You hear me? Amen. You keep loving them. Oh, I've got to shut up here in a minute. What did Jesus do here? When he talked to this guy, he marveled. He marveled that he believed the word. Wouldn't it be something if God looked at you and marveled that you actually believed the word? You just believed it. <laughs> what, what an amazing thing. He, he, he looked, he said, I've never seen such faith in all Israel. Hey, man, I didn't even have to go to God's house. I just said my word. And, and, and they confirmed it. When he got there, the servant was healed. He was already well. Listen, he holds your destiny. Everything about him. Destiny is the inevitable succession of events is fortune in your life. And that includes good, bad, and ugly. But he holds that. Amen. He sustains us in trouble. And we'll close with a couple of passages here. But in Psalm chapter 3, one of my favorite Psalms, David is being chased. Let me say it again. David chose to leave his kingdom because his son Absalom wanted to usurp it and become king. David chose, <laughs> look at, hey, you want it? I ain't fighting you. He loved Absalom. Nobody else did. Nobody, this long-haired pretty boy. Amen. David got, David loved him though. When Absalom was killed, David asked him, don't kill him. He said, don't kill him. But Joab, when Absalom's hair got caught in the, in the tree, Joab ran a, a dart through his heart and killed him. It acted like it was all right. Because Job, did, uh, 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 what was his name? Uh, Joab didn't like him. I'm telling you, not everybody likes your kids. David said, don't kill him. I love him. I will run. I'll give him the kingdom. I'll give him everything I got. It ain't worth it to me. I love him. I'm not affirming him, but I love him. And he ran away, and David got in a cave. And in the cave, he wrote this. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Well, be honest with God. Many are they that rise up against me. Talking about his son. Many there be which say of my soul, there ain't no help for him in God. Selah. Selah means pause and think about it. Do you realize there are people that think you crazy because you've put your hope in God? You have your hope in eternity? You have your hope and a belief in Jesus? And because of that, you're going to see loved ones again? They think you've lost your cotton picking mind? He said that. Selah. Think about it. I had a Rottweiler named Sela. She was attack trained. She was a bad dog. I named her Sela because it means when you see her, you better pause and think about it. <laughs> Somebody said, your dog bite? I said, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I laid me down and slept. I woke. For the Lord sustained me. He's my maintainer and my sustainer. When I go to sleep at night, if I wake up in heaven, that's good. If I wake up on earth, 
that's good. But he sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. David said, I counted them. There are ten thousand troops coming for me. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm telling you, man fear is the worst fear you can have. Arise, Lord, save me, oh my God. For thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. You broke the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs unto the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. He just stops and let me just tell you. Many are rising against me. Many say that I have no hope, but my hope is in God. He says in this passage that you are the glory and the lifter up of mine head. When a head is down, it speaks of low self-esteem. You don't like yourself. See, the one that you've got to forgive is you. We've all made mistakes. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. Actually, I, I get tired of people saying, well, everybody sinned. I know. And we're aware of that. But our self-esteem is connected to our past. And if God will forgive my past, I can get my head up again. And he said, they're after me to kill me. And he said, my own son is after me, God. But you are the glory and the lift. In other words, my self-esteem is in you and how much you love me. My esteem is in you and knowing at first that your head is too wise to make a mistake. Your hands hold me and love me too much. Amen. Matter of fact, you won't even fail me. You're that strong. You spun the earth. You spun the sun. You spun the, the galaxies. You got it all going. You sustain it by the word of your mouth. There are people out there that think this is a myth. Yet it makes more sense to me than evolution or anything else I've ever heard. It's a faith and a belief system in a God that loves us and sent his son to die for us. Proverbs 22 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. To be esteemed, to be lifted up, to value people. Pastor Joseph, when y'all went to Guatemala, y'all valued people. Jerome, you valued them. When you gave them value, you gave them hope. To esteem, to lift up a head. Sometimes we see our kids, our grandkids down. We want to lift their heads. We want their heads up. Get your head up. Get your head up. It's all right. Nobody's rode that bull more than six seconds. Just get back on it. Amen. Get your head up. Theme is how a person feels about themselves. It is their overall judgment of themselves, how much they like themselves. He lifts my head. Psalm 31, 15, my times are in your hands. We've heard it over and over, his right hand. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemy and from those who pursue me. Now, I'm going to close and tell you this. There's a devil pursuing you. He's pursuing your children, your grandkids. He's after their mind first, trying to change the way they think about you, about the gospel. He's after them. But I'm going to tell you something about him. He's got this world in his hands. And if he's got this world in his hands, he's got you and me in his hands, brother and sister. He got our children in his hands. So I'm going to back off just a little bit and say, God, you take care of them. I'm going to send your word. I'm believing that you're going to lift their heads. I'm believing you're going to change their hearts. I'm believing you're going to turn things around for my benefit and your glory. I'm going to stand and believe that. I'm going to believe that my brother, when he gets out of jail, he's going to be better than he ever was before. Amen. I, I, I talked to that young man yesterday, and he just, I was saying, do I look like a priest? He was confessing everything to me. I've been in jail. I've been here. This, that, and I'm listening to him. I said, do you have any idea who I am? He said, no. I said, well, that's good because I'm a preacher, not gossip. He maintains. He sustains. He's too powerful not to maintain you. Matter of fact, we need maintenance. We need constant maintenance. We need help in this world. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I want you to blanket your people right now.
blanket your people with grace and mercy. When their heads come up, Lord, remind them you are the glory and the lifter of their heads. That you marvel when they believe your word. That they leave this place knowing that even though this earth is moving a thousand miles an hour, I'm still stuck here and I don't feel a thing because you sustain this world. You created it with your voice. Help us to pray your word. Believe your word. Dig into your word. Find us in there. God, I thank you for this house. I thank you for those watching online. God, I ask for your, your that you would keep us safe in you in a world that's not safe. That you would secure us toward eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. If you believe your preacher, give God a hand today.